Hi, and welcome to Author Uncut. I'm your host and author, Patrice Williams Marks. Today's podcast is a little different. I thought I would step away from the coronavirus pandemic and read my last thriller to you, Counterpunch, and I thought I'd read it chapter by chapter, week by week. But first, if you enjoy my podcast, I'd be grateful if you spread the word by leaving a rating and a review. Author Uncut can be found wherever you enjoy listening to your podcasts. One day I woke up with this story idea in my head that I just had to write. It was about a mother who would go to any lengths to protect her child and seek revenge for what had been done to her. I'm a fan of those types of books and films. Are you? If so, you've probably seen Law Abiding Citizen, Taken, Flight Plan, and The Brave One. Here is what Counterpunch is about. Everyone is capable of murder. Everest was not the perfect mom, but what she was was fierce. After her husband Anthony died at the hands of a drunk driver, it was up to her to raise her daughter Mo alone. Her love for Mo was both unmistakable and unshakable. But when Mo failed to return home from swim practice with not so much as a text, Everest knew something was wrong. Will Evers find Mo in time to save her life? Better still, what will she do to the scumbag that brutalized her daughter? Make him pay. Chapter 1. Say It Ain't So. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and has struck a fatal blow, the defender's not guilty of bloodshed. Exodus 22. Two. I never thought I had the capacity to kill a person, I mean up close, using a weapon that, once it made contact with a human skull, would cause irrevocable damage. I was so enraged that using a gun was not an option for me. It did not have the human factor that I needed to satisfy my vengeance. I saw myself approaching him in a way that said there was no turning back. The centrifugal forces that propelled me forward would not allow me to stop. That whatever was going to happen would happen. No time out. No time for exchanges of words. No time for pleas. He was as good as dead. Everest pulled over to the side of the road and parked her car behind a new model Jaguar. Could this be the place, she thought? She knew it was a long shot, but didn't care. Her heart was pounding out of her chest, and her hand shook as she turned the ignition to the off position. She was in a neighborhood that was so unfamiliar, not because she felt uncomfortable in it, but because it wasn't a place that interested her. It was King Harbor, a suburb known for there being as many Starbucks as there were yoga studios. Evers had no idea what brought her to this neighborhood to park behind the Jaguar or to search for her daughter Monique. But something deep inside, a sharp, puncture-like throb, grew in strength the closer she approached that neighborhood. It crescendoed on the very picturesque street. This had to be it, she convinced herself. Everest was a stunning beauty with sharp edges to her jaw and a side profile meant for ancient currency. Her deep eyes either mesmerized you or scared the shit out of you. She made the most of what she was given. Her athletic and statuesque frame was only eclipsed by her tenacity. Everest was also a mother with a heart that pumped outside her body, a heart named Monique. From the moment Mo was born, Everest confided in her husband that someone else was number one now. That pronouncement rang true with Anthony as well, who felt the same way. 
Anthony always wanted a baby girl to call baby girl. It's what they both longed for. Anthony's strongest suit was his word and his bond. When he committed to anything, it was as good as gold. His stature was an inch below that of Everest, although he would never admit it. The man's legs were as strong as tree trunks and as solid. His hands were rough and calloused from many years working as a welder, yet his gentle touch was evident. As the years raced by, Monique morphed into a strong-willed girl with her mother's determination and her father's kindness. When Anthony was T-boned by a drunk driver on Moe's 11th birthday, on his way home with a birthday cake and a special present, Everest wanted to take matters into her own hands. How could the justice system make things right? One hundred years would not be enough time for the person who destroyed her family to be locked behind bars. During the victim impact statement, and after the driver was found guilty of reckless vehicular homicide by a jury of his peers, it was Monique who stood before the judge and jury to pour her heart out about what it had been like since her father was taken away. She recounted the ache of missing his reassuring arms around her and the chaos her life had become. Mo had brought the unopened birthday gift found in her father's car and set it down next to the mic as Everest held her hand. The judge had sentenced the driver to two years, which was then suspended, meaning he did not have to serve any more time than what he had already served while awaiting trial. He hugged his family amongst cheers and happy tears while walking out a virtually free man once again. And that's what they called justice. It was now three and a half years since the trial, and yet it felt like only months had passed. Mo was a teenager in theory, and had been for many years, with no sign of it ending. It was at that point that Everest decided to set her career aside as a color expert to tend to the needs of Mo. Everest had used her psychology degree within the realm of colors to consider marriage trends, demographics, and style when designing a room, an entire office interior, or company branding for her clients. Yet it no longer brought her joy or satisfaction. Everest had seen improvements in her daughter's academics, but Mo was still floundering in all other aspects of her life. Mo once loved to swim and was exceptional at it. In fact, she had been voted team captain of the swim team. However, since her father's passing, Mo was no longer the leader her teammates needed. Before his passing, Anthony built a special glass case in the living room simply to display his baby girl's achievements. It had tiny white pin lights strung on every shelf to make sure you didn't miss a one. The number of ribbons were only outdone by the number of trophies, which were dwarfed by the number of winning medallions. Mo was on the girls' meet of champions team, a freestyle fanon, as Anthony would boast. Mo loved being called a fanon by her dad, but never quite understood its meaning until he explained it to her. The photon is a quantum of electromagnetic radiation. The phonon is a quantum of sound that has waves and energy equal to their frequency. To Anthony, his baby girl, Mo, radiated energy that came in waves, one after the other. She was a force, strong and capable. Mo effortlessly made the NJAC all-conference team with an easy seven seconds faster than the qualifying time of 207.11. Whatever she put her mind to, 
she achieved. Everest swung her car door open and stepped outside. It even smelled different in King Harbor. She surveyed her surroundings before she shut the car door and made her way to the sidewalk. Monique was missing. It had only been three hours since Everest expected Monique home, but she knew something was off, and she always listened to her sixth sense when it spoke to her. She never second-guessed it, ever. Mo was in danger. After spending the last two hours scouring her own neighborhood, from the turnpike to Nelson's Deli to the skate park, Mo was nowhere to be found. Everest called Mo's friends, all who said Mo was in school all day and then headed for home after practice. None of them saw anything unusual or telling. Mo had pulled her hair back into a ponytail, stuffed her swimsuit into her bag, and drank two bottles of alkaline water before walking towards home. Three hours later, she had still not arrived, despite it only taking 14 minutes at the most to make the trip. Mo was not a perfect child. She did her share of door slamming and blaming of the surviving parent for all the ills of the world. Although petite for her age, she had the adolescent body of a swimmer. Her kinky curly hair brushed just past her shoulders, but was often in a tight ponytail, pulled back to reveal the identical side profile of her mother's. Mo had always come home as expected. She would text or call if unexpected circumstances delayed her. This was not something instilled in her by Everest or Anthony, but something she did on her own. And after Anthony was taken from her, she felt even more resigned to continue the practice. She remembered the waiting and wondering where her father was on the day of her eleventh birthday. She had sat staring out of the window, transfixed on their driveway, as if her sheer will would make him reappear. Everest removed her shades, observing with her naked eyes for an advantage or discovery. As she took each purposeful step, she knew she was on the right path and in the right neighborhood. No question about it. That's it. Join me next week for Chapter 2. Counterpunch can be found on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, Google Play, and Kobo. Want to leave me a voice message? Visit my anchor.fm page, the link is in the show notes, and click on the button that says Message to leave me one. I may just use your voicemail in a future podcast. Want to suggest a show episode or get in touch? Visit me at authoruncut.com or send me an email at mailbag at patricewilliamsmarks.com. And finally, to join our email list, go to authoruncut.com. Until next time, write on.